As you are turning there, here's my question to begin the morning. Have you ever been caught red-handed? Maybe it's a, a lie. Maybe it was shoplifting. Maybe it was speeding. Maybe, I don't know what it was for you. Maybe it was something small. Maybe it was something large. But you know that feeling when your gut drops, when you know you're busted, caught red-handed? I'm sure most of us know that feeling, probably all of us to some degree. Uh, when I was probably 13 or 14, I lived in this neighborhood in East Asheville and it backed up to the Swannano River and uh, my buddies were older than me. So they were like 16 and I was probably, I don't know when it was, maybe springtime or something. And they were like, hey, let's go fishing. Now I'm not a fisherman. I know some of you like it. I hate fishing. It's boring. It's messy. It smells. I don't like it. Whatever. If you do, God bless you. You can have all the fish. Okay. But so anyway, I go with them and uh, cause they're my buddies and I'm like, guys, well, this is stupid. And it's out of season. All right. And it's the Swannanoa. Like you're not going to catch anything good except a disease in the Swannanoa. So <laughs> we go down there and we're there about 20 minutes and uh, catching nothing, of course. And uh, all of a sudden behind us comes a wildlife official. Now I didn't hear a single leaf rustle. All right. I don't know how he got there. Just ninja magic. He was like, hey, fellas, what are you doing? What are we doing? We're fishing. You know what we're doing. And so then he's like, well, you know, it's out of season. That's a fine. Like, you're going to get a ticket for this. And so he starts asking our, our information. Well, I give him mine. I go first and I'm whatever, 13 or 14. My buddies are older than me and they're of age. But my one friend, Ryan, not this Ryan, a different guy, he, uh, he thinks he's going to like just bend the truth a little bit and get out of it. So he says, how old are you, son? And he goes, 14. And he goes, okay, when's your birthday? And Ryan goes, March 17th, 19th. I'm lying. <laughs> he couldn't do the math. It was amazing. But anyway, uh, just caught completely red-handed, could not get out of it. Now, maybe you got away with it, whatever it was. Maybe if you were found out, it wouldn't be that big a deal. Like you'd, it'd sting a little bit, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. But maybe if somebody knew what you had done, said, thought, tried to keep hidden, it'd crush you. There are parts in each of us, there are things in us that we want to keep hidden because they reveal the darkness of our heart just how sinful we really are. And that's why Joshua 7 matters so much to us. It shows a couple things. It shows our interdependence as the family of faith. And it also shows the great call to live lives of integrity that God has placed upon us. Now, last week we saw Ryan helped us, this Ryan, with uh, the fall of Jericho. And we saw that God gave this unusual uh, battle plan, right? We're essentially going to have the marching band just kind of go around the building once a day or the, around the city. And then on the seventh day, they're going to go around six times. But on the seventh time, they're going to yell. He'll say, shout, and they'll go, shout, and they'll just let it all out, right? And then the come on, tears for fear. Come on, somebody got to get that. And the walls will come tumbling down. And we saw that happen. Jericho has been defeated. Israelites are on a roll. Like you could almost see the montage if this was a movie, right? You can hear the victorious soundtrack coming. And then we get to chapter seven and everything er, just screeches to a halt. And it takes a pretty dark turn. So just fair warning. All right. Happy Father's Day. We're talking about sin today. All right. And so I'm going to start us at the end of chapter six. I'm just going to pray now. And then I'm going to start us at the end of chapter six. I'm going to read uh, probably to about verse nine of chapter seven. We'll stop and talk about it. And that, that'll kind of be what we do for the rest of the chapter, all right? So let me pray and then we'll dive into this. Father in heaven, uh, we are grateful that you are our father, that we are your children who have the right to be called sons and daughters of the most high God because of Jesus. That regardless of our past, regardless of our history with our own fathers, whether we know our father or not, whether we have a good history or a negative history with our father, whether we were praised and, and loved or neglected and abused, we know that you are a better father than even the best human father, that you love us unconditionally, that you provide everything that we need and then more. So help us, Father, this morning as we look at the book of Joshua to hear from our Father, to hear your words to us, very stern, 
but very merciful as well. Help us to take sin seriously and help us to rest in the mercy of Jesus Christ. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. All right, Joshua chapter six, I'm gonna start in verse 27 and then we'll move on to chapter seven. So this is after the battle of Jericho. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was in all the land. Chapter seven, but the people of Israel broke faith in regards to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah took some of the devoted things and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai or Ai. Scholars are divided on that. Hello, Lester, Lee Sester. All right. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai with their very eye. And then they returned to Joshua and said to him, do not have all the people go up, but about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men went up from there to the people. And they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, alas, O Lord, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we have been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. Bless you. Oh Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? All right, we'll stop there. Notice the contrast right off the gate here, out of the gate, between the end of chapter six and the beginning of chapter seven. The Lord was with Joshua, but... The people of Israel broke faith. Usually that little conjunction, but is a great Bible word. I think of Ephesians, right? We were separated from God in our sin, but God. It's a great little conjunction, not so much here. <laughs> the people broke faith. Now what is, what is faith? Essentially, faith is others-centered, right? It is trust in someone outside of yourself to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And so anytime that you and I sin, anytime that we decide to be our own authority, and that's really the essence of sin, right? Is saying, I'm going to be the authority here. I'm going to determine what's right and wrong. I'm going to call the balls and strikes. I don't need your authority because I have my own. Anytime that we choose to be our own authority, we are breaking faith. We're saying, God, I don't trust you. I don't need you. Now, it looks like just one guy broke faith. We hear about this man, Achan, and that's kind of true. But if we look a little deeper into the story, I think we'll see that everybody seems a little bit proud and complacent here. I mean, Jericho was defeated handily, right? God's people barely had to lift a finger. I mean, the walls came down with just a shout. They went in and took them easily, no problem. And Joshua's continuing with his plan, which is to literally divide and conquer. If you, look, if you saw a map of uh, this territory, he's coming in basically right in the middle through this sort of hilly range. And he's capturing, the plan is to capture these cities and literally divide the country in half and then conquer it. And that's what we'll see throughout the rest of the book of Joshua is that he literally divides and conquers. And so he moves on to the next city, which is this city of Ai. But notice... As he follows his same course of action, which is to send spies into the land to get the report back and then to advance, notice that nowhere in the text did God explicitly tell him to take I. Notice that nowhere in the text does Joshua consult the Lord or pray and ask what he should do next. He simply assumes, well, Jericho fell easily. It's on to the next thing. He, he fails to pray. He fails to consult the Lord. And we're going to see in a second that that does not go well for them. Then look at the spies. They send this report back. They go, look, this place is tiny, right? 
it'll be easy. We don't even need to play the starters. You know, like this is gonna be a cakewalk. Let's rest our guys. Well, they haven't even really fought yet, right? Because, jo- I mean, Jericho just fell. Like they didn't really need to battle. So this is not wise. Let's only send a few thousand. We've got 30, 40, 50,000 soldiers, but let's just send less than 10% of them in there. We don't, we don't need all of this group. And, and then we get our boy Achan who we learn is the son of, the son of, the son of. Why all these names? Well, those are real people. You gotta remember this was uh, originally oral tradition, right? And so they'd say the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi. And as people heard it, they went, wait, I know that guy, (laughs) right? These are real people, real events in the history of the world and in the history of God's people. And and it says that that, um, Achan took some of the devoted things. What does that mean? Well, if you were with us last week, Ryan mentioned in chapter six, there were a couple of verses. He's kind of said, put a bracket on this because we're going to come back to it. Let me read them for you really quickly. This is God's instruction, specific, explicit instruction to the people of Israel as they were conquering Jericho. Verse 18 of chapter six, this is what God says. But you, as you are capturing the city, keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction. Lest when you have devoted them, And you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So God gave some specific instructions. This is the very first battle. He says, you can have the land, but all of the treasure, all the gold and silver, all of the spoils of victory are mine, says God. They're devoted to me for my purposes, so hands off of them. And everybody heard it and everybody understood it. But Achan took a little bit for himself. We'll see in a few minutes what exactly he took. Here's a lesson just from looking at Joshua the spies and Achan that I think we need to be weary of, be aware of. Uh, We talked earlier in this series about self-sufficiency, how easily self-sufficiency kind of comes in and creeps in on us. And I, I, I hope you realize this already, but you and I are most vulnerable and most tempted into complacency and self sufficiency in times of success, not in times of struggle. In times of struggle, Many of us are on our knees, on our faces before God, pleading for his help because we know that we're up against something that's too big for us. We know that we're over our heads and we're asking for him to come and help us. We know that we need someone outside of ourselves to give us the empowerment to handle what we're dealing with. But when things are going well, when we find success, when the people of God pass through the Jordan River on dry ground, when They marched around the city and just went, ah, and it fell. (laughs) It's probably a little bit more aggressive than that, but, you know, I'm a pastor. So, uh, right, there's a sense in which success after success after success puffs you up a little bit, or it can at least. And that you and I are most tempted to complacency and most tempted to self-sufficiency when we have no needs, when things are going well for us. And so Joshua makes the plan. They go to Ai. They're going to take it with their 3,000 men, and they get their eye kicked, all right? They, they get it. This, 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 this does not go the way they expected it to go. And the text tells us that their hearts were melted within them, which is exactly what it said about the people of Jericho in reference to the Israelites, that they were so afraid of the Israelites that their hearts were melted within them. And then, and then Joshua, he is dumbfounded by what just happened. And so he goes to the Lord and he begins to complain. I would like to call it a lament. They do the sackcloth and the ash and they put on the she tears his clothes, verse six, falls to the earth before the ark, which is where the presence of God is said to dwell. But here, look at what he says, verse seven. Alas, O Lord, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all 
to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we've been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. This sounds just like the Israelites in the book of Numbers. When, when they're out in the wilderness and they have nothing to eat and nothing to drink and they go, oh, and that, that phrase, would that we, it's very awkward. It just means we would have been better off, right? Man, I wish we were back in Egypt. What did God just bring us out here to kill us? Just grumbling, complaining in their spirits. And Josh was getting pretty dramatic about this. But here's the reality. I mean, if you, like I read it and I'm like, man, what a pansy. He's just whining and crying. But at the same time, we know what Joshua doesn't know yet. That Achan has sinned. That Achan has taken the devoted things and that God is angry with the people because of the sin in the land. All he knows is that God told them, this is your land and now his men are dead. That's all he knows. But at least he takes it to the Lord, which is what he should have done in the first place, right? He should have consulted God in the first place and made sure they were supposed to go. He didn't, but now he doesn't say the right things. He basically makes some accusations, but at least he goes to the right place. God, what is going on? I love this last part when he's basically like, hey, we're in real trouble here and what are you gonna do about it? <laughs> Essentially blame, God, this is your fault. I went in like I'm supposed to and didn't, didn't work out. What are you gonna do? Your name is at stake here. And it reminded me that often I, I tend to make my own plans and I tend to take a couple steps towards my own plans and then they don't work out and guess who I blame? Not myself, of course. <laughs> that was a great plan. Lord, I, this was a great plan. And if you would have got on board with my plan, it would have worked out. What are you doing? You ever do that? You ever step out, get ahead of the Lord, and then blame him when it doesn't go quite the way you expected it to go? I'm sure you do. I know I do. Or, or maybe I try to consult him. Hey, look, Jesus, if you just, he, I've laid it out on paper you don't have to think about it. Let me, like, this is great, all right? Just let's go with my idea. It's a good, no. How often do we find ourselves blaming God when he doesn't fulfill our plans? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's look at the next little section here, verses 10 to 15. You guys hanging in? Verse 10. I love this part. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. That's the way I read it. It has an exclamation point. Get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more. That might be one of the most frightening lines in all the scripture. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, they are our devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes. And the tribe that the Lord takes by lot, kind of like rolling dice, the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans. And the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households. And the household that the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Now, when I read that, the first thing that comes to my mind is seeing a toddler lose their ever-loving mind at Walmart. And there's, parents deal with that in two ways. One, one type of parent tries to reason with Tommy. And so they'll get down with little two-year-old Tommy and go, Tommy, no, we don't want to do this. What? Let's, you know, and, and two-year-olds don't know how to reason. I don't know if you know that. They're master manipulators, but they don't reason well. And then another kind of parent just goes, get up. <laughs> it's my kind of parent. <clears throat> so 
You know, they're not, it's like, I know what you're doing. You put on a show trying to embarrass me. Guess what? Not working. I'll just let you be there all day long if you want to, because I got shopping to do. Like I, God's kind of doing that to Joshua. Stop whining. Get up. Listen, there is sin in the camp. And until that sin is dealt with, I will not go with you. And then God says, they, the whole people, they, look at it, sinned, they transgressed, they have taken, they have stolen, they lied. Now we know, because we've read ahead here, that Achan is primarily responsible, but God is holding the entire community liable. Let that sink in for a minute. One man's concealed, unrepentant sin turned God's presence away from the entire people of God. That is how seriously God takes sin. It's possible. And, and listen, Achan wasn't the leader. He's just some guy, right? It wasn't like it was Joshua or Moses before them who had the issue and God was like, look, until the leader gets, repents and gets his act. No, no, no. He just was an average guy among the people. And because of his willing, unrepentant, hidden sin, God's presence was removed from the entire people of God. God could withhold blessing from this community because of you. Just let that sink in for a second. See, we think that our private, personal sin doesn't affect anyone else. I hear people say that all the time. Well, this is my, it's just me, it's just my thing. It doesn't bother anyone, doesn't affect anyone. That's kind of the MO of our culture. What I do in private in my own house is no one else's business. It doesn't matter, doesn't affect anybody else. So let's just let everybody be and do whatever they want. It's a lie. Okay? One, your sin is never in isolation. Two, our sin is never without consequence for the community. Think about your own family growing up. Some of you had great families. Some of you had really bad families. Everybody had sinful families. Okay? Think about some of the sins of your parents or siblings and how they affected you growing up and even now. Some of you had addiction in your family background, right? Mom or dad was addicted uh, to drugs or alcohol or something, and that has affected you deeply. Some of you had parents who uh, committed infidelity, okay? And their sin has absolutely affected you still even to this day. Some of you grew up in abusive homes. Some of you grew up with neglect because your parents weren't around. Some of you had siblings who just went off the rails and it affected you. And it was their personal private sin, but you suffered the consequences of it. Why do we think that our personal private sin won't affect anybody else? It's ludicrous. Your sin is never in isolation and your sin is never without consequence for the community. So why do we think our sin doesn't or won't affect anybody else? God calls it an outrageous thing here. Did you catch that at the end, verse 15? Because, and then he, he does specify, he who has taken the devoted things shall be burned with fire, he and all the, that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Now we might think, well, what's the big deal, right? A little later on, what we're gonna learn is he took a robe and some silver and gold. And we're like, I mean, that's not that big a deal the Jericho people clearly weren't going to be using that robe. What's the problem? Why is it such a big deal? Here's what made it so outrageous. God explicitly said not to touch the devoted things. Now look, God didn't need that stuff. God doesn't need some dude's robe, right? He's not like, ooh, can you grab me that one? Like he's not, you know... He doesn't need the silver. He doesn't need the gold. He owns everything. But this was a, a, a test of faith for the people of God. Will you trust me? Will you trust my provision for you? Will you put 
me first and will you listen to me and trust in my provision? I'm telling you, as a parent, my kids now are 12, uh, 10, and eight, um, and even still this bothers me, but particularly when they were younger, nothing, I'm gonna be real vulnerable with you, nothing was more enraging, nothing is more enraging to me as a parent than giving specific, explicit instruction to one of my children, have them look me in the eye and then completely ignore or disregard what I said. Amen? Amen. Okay, I will go Old Testament on you, all right? (laughs) And if I, now part of that's my pride, certainly. I'm, you know, I want to be listened to and respected, but part of it is a valid God-honoring anger because children are supposed to obey their parents. But if I get that, like if that bothers me, how much more, like if, if the degree, my child to me is like one degree of authority, but we're talking God and you and me, like the ultimate authority and us. And we're going, yep, heard you, going to do my own thing. Okay. And here's what, here's the most probably enraging thing about that. My kids would do that and then still expect a snack (laughs) or allowance or TV time, you know, like, are you serious? You, right. So These people are supposed to be holy, set apart for God. But you cannot stand while also trying to cover your sin. You can't. So he says, consecrate yourselves. Tomorrow, God's going to narrow it down by tribes and then by clans and then by families. And, you know, and then he's going to pick the person who did it. Now, remind you, there are tons and tons, tons, hundreds of thousands of people. And so my suspicion is Aiken heard this plan and he was like, the odds are ever in my favor, right? (laughs) But he didn't know God had his number. Uh, A couple weeks ago, we were at the beach and there's been a couple of like shark attacks in North Carolina beaches recently. We were down towards Charleston But, you know, anyone who's a six Enneagram would go, well, that's not that far, right? So the sharks could come down. And so my kids and I were having, right? My kids and I were having these conversations about sharks because they wanted to get in the water and they wanted to go further out. And I was like, yeah, probably not a good deal. But um, my son was telling me, well, dad, there's actually a lot of things that are, the odds of dying by these things are even higher than like shark attack, dying from a shark attack, chances are very low. And here are some of the things that we found um, you can die by these things. You're more likely to die by these things than by sharks. Coconuts. <laughs> cows. Yeah, cows will headbutt you, so watch out. Wind. Hot water from your tap, by the way, all right? Tripping. Vending machines and being left-handed. I promise you that's a thing. <laughs> The article I looked at said you are like two times more likely to die in accidents if you're left-handed than right-handed. So watch out, okay? Because you're trying to do something with a right-handed tool and, you know, then you go meet Jesus. So (laughs) the odds are not in Achan's favor. God has his number. Here's my question before we move on, and I'm going to try to hit the gas here because I want to get you guys out and get your... Father's Day brunch on or whatever you're doing. How often do you and I disregard God's clear and explicit words while still expecting his blessing? We know what he has said about how to, how to steward our bodies, how to steward our money, how to treat our spouses or our children, how to have good work ethic at, in our jobs. How, I mean, we know what God has said to us and yet how often do we ignore his explicit words to us and yet still expect him to bless us. All right, last section, verse 16. Good job hanging in. I'm gonna read these 10 verses and then I'm just gonna sum them up, okay? So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel nearby, excuse me, brought Israel near, tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was taken. That's Achan's tribe, by the way. So it's going, okay. 
And he brought near the clans of Judah, and the clan of the Zarahites was taken. And he brought near the clan of the Zarahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Now, we already mentioned Zabdi's name, so Achan's getting a little nervous. And he brought near his household man by man. And Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I did. When I saw something among the spoils, a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them. And I took them and see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and behold, it was hidden in the tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the people of Israel. And they laid them down before the Lord. Joshua and all Israel with him and they took Achan, the son of Zerah and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold and his sons and daughters and his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor, which means trouble. Joshua said, why did you bring this trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones and they burned him with fire and they stoned them with stones. They raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. And the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the valley, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor, Valley of Trouble. It gets heavy here. As I read this, the first question that comes to my mind is why the long drawn out process? Like, you know, to narrow down, there's 12 tribes and then there's this many clans and this many, I mean, this is gonna take all day long. What? God knows it was Achan. He could have just been like, hey, Joshua, it was Achan. And then problem solved, right? It's done. Why this long drawn out process? Why act so slowly? And I think the answer is mercy. God was giving Achan time to confess instead of being found out. This may seem severe, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, but, but you have to realize God is a God of justice, but he's also a God of mercy. And I think it's Second Timothy where Paul says, God doesn't desire that any should perish, but that all should repent. That is God's heart. That is God's desire. And I think he was delaying and allowing this process to go forth so that Achan could, of his own volition, go, it was me, guys. I did it. But he never did that. He waited and he waited and he waited until he was busted. What, what might have happened? We don't know, but what might have happened if he had just confessed instead of being found out? Like, it's always better to confess than to be found out. Always. And listen, you don't think this is true, but you will be found out. For some, it's just an acknowledgement that your sin is actually sin. Some people want to turn a blind eye to it. They go, well, this is just the way that I am. Or this is, you know, I grew up Irish, so I just, I'm angry, right? No, you're sinning. Because you're a sinner. And some t we just have to acknowledge sometimes that our sin is actually sin. Admit that we have stuff to work on. For other people, it means coming clean. It means admitting that we actually are, are trying to hide things that are not good for us because we know. It's like having can't, sin is a cancer. And without confession without admitting it, without allowing other people into it, it's like trying to treat cancer with cough syrup. It's just not gonna work. Like you gotta get it out. You gotta shed light on those dark places in our hearts in order for God to deal with them. And so Joshua does exactly what the Lord instructs him to do, lot by lot, right? It's narrowed down and Achan is exposed. He's busted and then he confesses. And I'm gonna do this quickly, but notice the order. He says, I saw, I, I coveted, and I took. If you're familiar with the scripture, that's almost exactly what Eve says about the fruit. I saw the fruit. I noticed that it was 
good, pleasing, and good for food, and so I took it. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Now, what is coveting? Um, Simplest definition is inordinate desire or desiring what belongs to another. We're back to our Ten Commandments series we did last summer. And by the way, the sermon on coveting was our most listened to and downloaded and watched of that Ten Commandments series, which I found very interesting. But we know coveting starts in the heart. Every other of the commandments is an external action, but coveting starts in the heart. No one can see you coveting. It's a private thing. It's your own. It's personal. It's private. No one knows. Why is it a big deal? Because the heart drives your actions. And then you start to scheme, and then you take action, but it all starts in the heart. What are you, what are you coveting this morning? What are you scheming on that doesn't belong to you or that, that you have inordinate desire for? If I could just get this, if I could just have that, then my life would mean something. I need you to see this. This is heavy and hard. Aiken's entire family suffers for his sin. Now, scholars are split on this, but it's likely that his family was in on it. In the sense that they lived in a tent together, and all of a sudden there's a hole. <laughs> it's covered up with, you know, like, hey, Dad, what's in the hole? Shh, don't, you know, like... Or his wife catches him trying on the robe, you know, I don't know. But it's likely that the family was covering for Aiken. And so they're not guiltless in this, okay? But here's the other thing, and and maybe on Father's Day, this is particularly important. Men, I need you to hear me on this. You set the tone for your family in regards to sin. What's allowable, what isn't. How quickly you confess or excuse or blame shift. Like, like now, men, all of us, but particularly men, now is the time that we are done hiding our sin, that we are done covering our sin, that we're done excusing our sin. Because the things that you hide will kill you. And your sin will harm the people that you love. Absolutely will. Some people think that this is a a pretty big punishment for a pretty small sin, but that's because we don't take sin seriously. It's because we don't think it's a big deal. You have to understand that all sin, at any time that you or I choose to be our own authority, whether it's a sin of action or thought or word or deed or anything else, every single sin is cosmic treason. You know what treason is, right? Betraying your country. This is usually how we use the term, but okay, let's just say that you betrayed a friend. That's hard. But it seems worse if you betray your family, right? Or maybe if you betray your company and steal from your company. Maybe if you were, the, the level of punishment seems to go up in our American world, doesn't it? And in some countries, if you are, found guilty of treason and betraying your country, what's the penalty? Death. And no one bats an eye at that. But yet when we commit cosmic treason against the God of the universe and he says, you shall die in your sins, we go, well, that's not fair. Really. Here's the reality, brothers and sisters. We're all aching. We're all guilty of complacency. We're all guilty of self-sufficiency. We're all guilty of open rebellion before a holy God. We are sinners, transgressors, thieves, liars, and more. And we hide and we cover and we excuse our sin. And if our standing before God was only dependent on our record, you know what we all deserve? We all deserve to be buried under a pile of rocks at the valley of trouble. But thanks be to God, that is not our fate in Christ. Let me read you one little passage from the book of 1 Corinthians. Many of you will know this well. Do you not know 
that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. But, here's a great but of the Bible, all right? But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I love that. The unrighteous, these who consistently, willingly, unrepentantly practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's who all of us in this room were at one time. But those of us in Christ, that is no longer our identity Such were some of us, but we are no longer because we've been washed, sanctified, justified, all passive, all past tense. In a decisive once for all, for all time action, Jesus who was sinless and pure and giving and generous and truthful came for us and was condemned as a sinner, a transgressor, a thief, and a liar for us so that our guilt could be cleansed, you were washed. So that we could be set apart for God, you've been sanctified. So that we could be forgiven and our shame covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you have been justified. And no matter our past, In Christ, hear this clearly, no matter your past, no matter your baggage, no matter what you walked in here with, in Christ, God's viewpoint towards you is not condemnation, but healing. And in Christ, we are free to confess. We got nothing to hide. He knows us to the bottom. Everything about us, every dark part of our hearts is already exposed to the Lord Jesus. So we are free to confess. We are enabled to repent, to turn from sin and to turn to Jesus. And we are empowered by the spirit to walk in holiness. Now, one last thing. Here's the kicker. I just want to touch on these first two verses. Hang in there with me, y'all. Real quick. First two verses of Joshua chapter 8. Just look at this. The Lord said to Joshua, do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city, and his land. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. No, no, look, look at this. God gives the command, okay? Like when, if Joshua had gone to God in the first place and said, is it time to take I? This is what God would have said. Now he says it, take it. But he, did you notice the irony here? This is like the end of a Twilight Zone episode, you know? He allows the people to take the spoils from this battle for themselves. In other words, if Achan had only trusted in the Lord, he would have enjoyed more than he was able to sneak away. See, sometimes we hide in our sin because we think, well, if I, if I hold on to this, then it's mine. But if I give it up, then it'll never be replaced. And that's just not true. Whatever you think you're getting out of your rebellion and sin, God will give you far more enjoyment and pleasure in righteousness than he will in unrighteousness. You have to understand that God's commands are not a threat to us. He's not a cosmic killjoy. He's not out to ruin all of our fun. He loves us and his commands are intended for our good. But he is also a righteous and a just God. All right, one more verse, I lied. One more verse, I'm just gonna read this and then I'm going to the question. I promise, all right? This is what the Lord says about himself. Exodus 34, seven, the Lord, the Lord a God merciful and gracious, 
slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This is what we saw with Achan. But God is merciful and gracious and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness to you. So I have four questions for you as we respond to the Lord, and here they are. First question will be up on the screen. Uh, You can write these down or, all right, I got them on my thing here anyway. Where have I broken faith with God? Is there any sin in me that I'm either not acknowledging or actively hiding? Where have I broken faith? Where have I basically declared to God, I don't trust you? I'm unwilling to acknowledge or actively hiding my sin. Second question. When am I most tempted or vulnerable to complacency or self-sufficiency? I kind of gave you that answer earlier, right? But just think about your own life and circumstance and when you find yourself most tempted to just be complacent and rely on yourself and your own abilities and not consult or pray to the Lord. Third, what am I coveting in this stage of my life? And am I fighting it? Think at every stage of our lives, we see people who are ahead of us, who are more successful than us, who have more quote unquote blessings than we do, and we're tempted to covet what they have because we want it for ourselves. What is it that I'm coveting in this stage of my life? And am I fighting against that covetousness? Am I fighting against that temptation to want something that I don't have and not to rely on what God has given me? And then last question, how can trusting in Jesus free me to trust God's provision and to be honest about my sins, to not have to hide anymore? All right. I know it's a real cheery, encouraging Father's Day sermon, but uh, that's why we just preach through the Bible, man. All right? doesn't matter what, uh, you know, made-up holiday we celebrate. So I'm going to pray for you, and then, uh, I'm sorry. Forgive me, Lord. Um, I'm going to invite you to respond to the